Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for the SECO Certified Continuing Education Series. Today, we will be learning about centrifugal pump fundamentals presented by SECO Environmental. My name is Mary Rusnak, and I'm the Marketing Manager for the Industrial Air and Fluid Solutions segment of SECO. And with me today is Jerry Delterio, Director of Global Business Development, and Eric Burachinsky, Engineering Supervisor for SECO. Uh, while we wait for everyone to join, I'd like to go over some basic housekeeping items about our webinar platform and the PDH certification. Uh, there do seem to be some lag issues today. I think, unfortunately, the cold and snow that's hitting the, all of us here might be affecting the platform. So hopefully that's not the case, but we're going to do what we can to work through this. So if you have any sound issues, just make sure that you check your media player, take a look and make sure that your uh, button isn't muted. Take a look at the help widget, which would be your blue arrow. See if there's something that you can do there. And then always uh, log out, log back in. You can use the same link from the email that you used before. And hopefully that will uh, help you on any of the issues that you're having. You can also hit the F5 to refresh. So if you take a look at the bottom of your screen, there are multiple application engagement tools or widgets that you can use. All the widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get to the most of your desktop space. You can expand your uh, slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner of uh, the window. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. To keep ourselves on track, all questions will be held until the end of the presentation, but you can submit your questions at any time. If we do not get to your question live, don't worry about it. We will contact you later for sure. A copy of today's slide deck and additional help materials are available in the resource list. We encourage you to download any resources or links that you may find useful. Uh, take a look. You can find our LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube page. Uh, anyone who is taking the PDH uh, portion and, and is going to be taking the quiz later on, you might want to take a look at the centrifugal pump summary. That's a hint for all of you taking the quiz. Uh, the uh, PDH, or Professional Development Hour State Information, is also listed in the resources. Uh, we are offering credits in 36 states right now. All those widgets on the bo bottom, just hover over them and they'll tell you basically what they do. If you take a look at the check mark widget on the bottom, that'll take you to SECOcertified.com, where you'll find the rest of our schedule here for the first, uh, first three events at least. And it'll also show you of our, all of our on-demand events that are available at any time. We are planning on doing at least eight events this year, so um, come back frequently and take a look and see what we have. So finally, last two uh, widgets on the end, the test here and the track here, those are the ones that you will need to monitor if you are uh, here for the PDH portion. You will need to make sure that you take the test and you will want to track your uh, goals and if you've made the, fulfilled the criteria with the track here widget. Webinars are bandwidth intensive, so make sure you close anything down, um, any tabs that are open. And if your slides are behind, try hitting F5 on your keyboard to refresh the page. We found that Chrome seems to be the best uh, browser for this application. Excuse me, for this application. Uh, you can find additional answers to any te uh, technical questions by using that help widget. And an on-demand version of this webcast will be available after the event and can be accessed uh, at any time, um, and you can basically have the same functionality that you have now, so all the resources will be available. So today's webinar is worth one professional development hour. You must be present for at least 50 minutes. This is both for the live or the on-demand viewer. If you get interrupted or and or you need to leave, just come back to the on-demand version and you can complete whatever you haven't finished. You must complete and pass the test, which is eight out of 10. And then when you're done, you will have a little block that pops up that will uh, allow you to print your certificate. So once all that is met, just look for that uh, thing that allows you to print the PDH certificate and you'll be all set. You, you can also come back at any time and print it out. This webinar is one hour long, but we will keep the platform open for an additional 30 minutes after the event to allow completion of the quiz and printing of any materials. So don't worry, you'll have time at the end to finish up anything that you need. Today we're going to look at 
uh, basically centrifugal pumps, but obviously we want to take a look at the history. What is a centrifugal pump? What are the most important parts? You know, what are the main parts? We're also going to look at how do you read a pump curve? How do you do some selection? And basically also sizing a motor. So we're going to move on to our first poll question here, which, oh, it's working here. Okay. So how much experience do you have with pump selection and use? And you'll be able to answer the question in the next slide, okay? So I'm an expert, I have some experience, I have a little experience, what in the world is a pump? So give you a second here to answer the question. All right, and let's see what we have in terms of answers. Okay, we have a majority of the people here have a little bit of experience in it, you know, some experience in it, or a little bit of experience. So a um, couple experts in here and some who are here just to learn the very basics. So uh, this presentation is pretty well uh, presented in terms of allowing for any person at any level to get something out of it. So we appreciate having you here. And I'm going to pass this on now to Jerry, who is going to move into the meat of the presentation. Jerry? Thank you, Mary, for the introduction. I'm excited to be here today. Uh, for those of you that know me, I'm passionate about this topic. I'm passionate about pumps. I love pumps. And what better way uh, than to warm our hearts today with this presentation, considering uh, the battering that a lot of us are taking with this bad weather uh, across the U.S. So let's get started. Every industry requires a pump somewhere in operation. There are lots and lots of pumps available on the market. The key question, though, really comes down to which one is right for you? And remember this question because I'll be coming back to it. Understanding which one is right for you, and more specifically, your application, is critical to reducing costs increasing the life of your pump, and your overall system. Having said this, when we look at the slide that we're on here, pump types are grouped or classified into two categories. On the left, you see centrifugal pumps. Here, the working principle involves the transfer of energy from a driver, typically an electric motor, to the liquid by a spinning impeller. On the right, for positive displacement pumps, or PD pumps, here the working principle involves an operation that moves fluid by trapping a fixed volume, usually in some sort of cavity, and then forcing that trapped fluid or liquid into the discharge pipe. At this point, I'm not going to spend too much time going into the various types or designs of centrifugal pumps, as I'll be covering that later in the presentation. Taking a further look at, at PD pumps, though, you can see that they are further broken down into rotary or reciprocating. Let's take rotary first. Think about rotary in the sense that operation is via the rotation of a specific pumping element. Let's take a gear pump as an example. Gear pumps consist of, guess what, gears that are arranged with teeth meshed together. The gears rotate in opposite directions so that they pull fluid into the spaces between the gear teeth and the pump casing. The fluid is finally released through the pump discharge due to the movement of the teeth. With reciprocating, think of this operation via a constant back and forth motion or movement. A good example here would be a piston pump. So the pump consists of a cylinder and a piston with two one-way check valves. 
one at the inlet and one at the outlet of the pump. On the suction stroke of the piston, the discharge one-way valve is drawn shut and the inlet one-way valve opens due to the suction in the cylinder, thereby drawing fluid into the cylinder. As the piston reverses direction and begins the discharge stroke, the inlet valve is pushed shut and the outlet valve is pushed open so that the fluid is ultimately pushed out of the discharge port of the pump. So again, the key takeaway here with rotary rotation via specific pumping element, reciprocating a constant back and forth motion. And this is also why, as we heard in the piston pump description, you're using check valves at the inlet and the outlet of the pump to guide the liquid through. With this next slide here, this is a good reference page that was put together, uh, really just tending to highlight some working ranges or differences between centrifugal and PD. The takeaway here is with a centrifugal pump, you're generally dealing with lower viscosities, higher flow rates, and lower pressures. Conversely, with a PD pump, higher viscosity, lower flow rates, higher pressures. So think with a PD pump, um, pumping thick oils, flurries, sewage, pastes, and even mediums that tend to have high levels of solids. A further comparison page here and there's a lot of information on this page. Differences have been categorized looking at the working principle, the flow rate, the viscosity, applications, and pressure. I'm not going to read all the information on this page, but there is one golden nugget or one key takeaway if you're going to remember anything. PD pumps will move fluid at the same speed regardless of the pressure on the inlet, while centrifugal pumps will not. A key, key difference, and again, if there's something you're going to walk away with, remember that golden nugget. The next part of the presentation, we're going to review some history. This was actually pretty fun, putting all this information together. Uh, we start here on the left in 2000 B.C., the first pump being the Shadoof. Again, you see a massive technological innovation here. Uh, hopefully you're picking up my sarcasm. Basically a long suspended rod with a bucket on one end and a weight on the other end, ultimately used to draw water from wells. We move on to the water wheel. Basically a wooden wheel fitted with various buckets to lift water at a constant rate. The first piston pump, and I just got done describing a little bit of the workings of a piston pump in the previous slides. And really probably the most interesting one here, uh, the screw pump. At the time, this was actually considered the greatest invention of all time. It was developed to irrigate the rich agricultural region of the Nile Delta and basically to pump out ships. This type of pump is still used in the industrial world today and third, third world countries, and it's actually the preferred way in third world countries to irrigate fields without the use of electric pumps and or motors. So where do centrifugal pumps come into play? Centrifugal pumps, we have to date ourselves back here to the 1600s. Specifically in 1687, French born inventor Denis Papin, and for all my French friends out there, you'll, you'll like my pronunciation, uh, he developed the first true centrifugal pump, one which was a straight vein design used for draining local canals. In 1849, 
We had the first all-metal centrifugal pump manufactured. And right around this time, a lot of people really started to look at the design of a centrifugal pump and how to start to change to make them more efficient and effective at how they actually displace fluid or liquid. This is where British inventor John Apold came into play with the curved vein centrifugal pump design. Looking at this picture to the right from the engineer in 1863, I thought this was pretty neat uh, because it's actually highlighting early centrifugal pump design. It's looking at casing design and impeller design. And it highlights that while certainly we've come a long, long way in terms of optimizing performance with all the capabilities and tools that we have today, it's just very interesting to see that the concepts that we're dealing with today also existed back then. So I kind of stopped at this point when I was putting this information together and, and I was thinking to myself, what, what's the key takeaway here with this history? What, what do I personally take away from all of this? And I kind of boiled it down to, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter what liquid you're dealing with. It could be water. It could be oil. It could be you name it. There is a pump out there in the market that will move it. That's the key. And it really brought me back to the question that I raised earlier, which one, which one is right for you when I was referring to the pump? For those of us or those of you in the pump industry, we know that it's a close network of people. Once you're in it, it's hard to get out of it. A lot of different companies, we all compete with one another. We always look for ways to optimize performance and efficiency with our offerings while investing in R&D and innovation so that we can address the pump needs of tomorrow and, again, be able to answer that question for you, which one is right for you. We're coming to the end or close to the end here of the history section, and I wanted to bring up something that I find as a source of pride uh, for SECO, and in this case, more specifically, Dean Pump, um, our metallic uh, pump division. In 1958, Dean introduced its pH series pump, uh, a centrifugal chemical process pump. This pump was ad adopted by what was called the American Voluntary Standard, the ABS. The key takeaway here is that ABS actually became the foundation for ANSI ASME B73.1 specification as we know it today. I don't know how many people know that or knew about that, but I thought it was kind of neat to bring it up. Uh, the ANSI spec being a design and specification standard for horizontal and suction centrifugal pumps. ANSI pumps manufactured by different companies are dimensionally interchangeable. And what it ultimately means for the end user is that it allows the end user to switch brands without affecting piping location, the motor attachment, coupling, and or base plate dimensions. So at this point, um, we now move into the meat of the presentation, the real fun stuff. So in general, a pump is a mechanical device, i.e. a machine used to move a liquid from point A to point B. The slide here shows the definition of a centrifugal pump. And really the operating principle of the centrifugal pump is to convert mechanical energy pressure. You see here looking at the drawing on the right, liquid in a suction pipe enters the casing and hits the eye of the impeller. In operation, a rotating impeller accelerates a liquid, flings that liquid out of the impeller to the periphery of the casing, via centrifugal force, and as the area of the pump casing expands, the velocity of the fluid or liquid 
is converted to pressure. As a result, pressurized fluid or liquid exits the pump discharge. What I really liked about this drawing, so we kind of see there's arrows on the red impeller that is showing uh, the rotation, is meant to show the rotation of the impeller counterclockwise, also showing the liquid moving from the center of the eye out to the periphery of the casing. Looking at this casing, you have a very small gap or area between the casing and the impeller towards the top end of the casing. As you move around the body of the casing, the yellow is, is meant to show increasing area. So you're going from a high velocity, low pressure area where the gap between the impeller and casing is small to a low velocity, high pressure area as your area increases as you move around the casing. Next, we're going to be moving on to the most important parts of the pump. The focus here is going to be on the casing and the impeller. So centrifugal pumps basically consist of a stationary pump casing and an impeller mounted on a rotating shaft. The pump casing provides the pressure boundary for the pump and contains channels to properly direct the suction and discharge flow. We're going to start with the impeller. The impeller design is the most important factor for determining the performance of a centrifugal pump. A properly designed impeller optimizes flow while minimizes turbulence and maximizes efficiency. When looking at the impeller, we're going to look at three specific areas. The first area is the inlet flow arrangement. This basically is meant to show the number of points that liquid can enter the impeller. Looking at the picture on the left, you'll note a single suction arrangement. Here the liquid enters the impeller at the center of the impeller from one direction only, the direction as indicated by the red arrow. On a double suction arrangement, the liquid enters the center of the impeller from both sides simultaneously, again noted by the red arrows. This helps reduce the forces exerted on the shaft. Moving on to design flow. Design flow really speaks to the manner in which the fluid flows through the pump. Obviously, in this case, this cannot be a discussion of impeller alone, but it has to involve both impeller and casing. The only takeaway that I wanted to show with, with this here is that you have three different types of flow. With axial flow, liquid is moving parallel to the impeller, as noted in red. With radial flow, the liquid is moving at right angles to the impeller, as noted in green. With mixed flow, this takes the characteristics of both axial and radial flow. Liquid is moving at an angle a bit different than the right angle of radial flow, typically greater than 90 degrees. And that is shown in the blue. The last piece of the puzzle with regards to the impeller gets into the physical design of the impeller. Now, looking at these pictures from left to right, open, semi-open, and closed design. As you can see from the open design, the impeller veins are free on both sides. With the semi-open design, the veins of the impeller are free on one side, in this case, the top side, and enclosed are what's referred to as shrouded 
on the bottom side. Shrouding an impeller often adds mechanical strength to the impeller as well. On a closed design, the vanes are located between two shrouds, front and back. Couple takeaways. In general, an open impeller is going to be less efficient than a closed impeller. The reason for this has to do to the tight impeller vein and casing tolerance clearances required to maintain efficiency. Also in general, looking at an open impeller, it's less expensive to manufacture and inspect. It's also faster and easier to clean and clear any clogging that may result from what you're pumping. And as a result, it tends to be better with solids handling and handling of stringy and or fibrous type materials. Moving on to the casing, a lot of good information here. I'll start by addressing the first piece. You'll note that in the three pictures, there's a differentiation between a tangential discharge, picture on the left, and the two pictures on the right, which are top center line discharge. Most chemical process anti-type pumps utilize top center line discharge. Essentially, this means the discharge plant center is in the same vertical plane as the pump's center line. Why do people prefer this arrangement more than tangential? It simplifies piping layout. It helps to reduce piping strain because you're actually equally distributing the piping weight to the casing feet. And it makes the casing self-venting, which translates into clear and free passage of air. So that's one key takeaway. Second takeaway, the cut water. You'll see a definition on the screen. I often refer to the cut water as the wedge or, or the nose in the casing. And another way to restate the definition is it helps cut the stream of liquid and deflect the liquid into the discharge. That's the second takeaway. The third takeaway on casing design is single volute versus dual volute design. In a dual volute, you're minimizing radial forces imparted to the shaft and bearings due to the imbalance of pressure around the impeller. So you're probably thinking, wow, that sounds really great. What the heck does that mean? So boiling that down, under ideal conditions, the pressure within a casing balloon is equal on all sides of the impeller, okay? When the pump operates away from its design point, where it's meant to operate, the pressure varies. This results in radial loading on the impeller and shaft. In order to limit the shaft stresses and any subsequent shaft deflection, a good idea is to utilize a dual volute casing. Looking at the picture, furthermost to the right. The pump volute is basically partitioned into two flowways. It essentially has two cut waters, as called out for in the drawing, that are basically 180 degrees apart from each other. So when the pump is operating away from its best efficiency point, which Eric will be discussing in a bit, the radial forces are equalized and the stress on the pump shaft is almost unchanged. That's the beauty or the advantage of using uh, a dual volute casing. At this point, I believe Mary's gonna step in because we're at another poll question here. Mary, do you Thanks, want to introduce Jerry. this? Sure. Yeah, so our next poll question, see if you guys were um, from a couple of slides ago. So of the impeller designs we just discussed here, which is generally the most efficient? And you can answer in the next slide. So open, semi-open, or closed? I'll give you all a couple seconds here. 
answer the question. Okay, finish up and let's see. Wow. All right. You guys are paying attention 100%. <laughs> All right. Good job, Marie. That is correct. Closed is the most, generally the most efficient. So good job. Back to you, Jerry. Thank you, Mary. So next, we're going to look at the main parts of a centrifugal pump. Uh, I tried to boil this down, as, as the slide shows here, to the main parts and not really go overboard. So I identified seven parts, and I wanted to distinguish the front end of the pump to the back end of the pump. I'm not going to discuss much of one, two, and three, the casing, cover, and impeller, because we've gone through the casing and impeller. But a takeaway that I would like you to have is that when you think of the wet end of the pump, as shown in the box on the slide, think of the wet end dictating hydraulic performance, okay? When you think of the mechanical end of the pump, also shown boxed out here in green, think of this as the means by which the wet end creates flow and pressure. Looking at the bearings, you have an inboard bearing and an outboard bearing. Typically, these tend to be ball-type anti-friction bearings. The pump shaft is supported and held in place by these bearings, and these bearings need to be designed to handle all the loads created by rotation of the impeller and also sized for reasonable life. Looking at the shaft, item number four, the impeller is mounted on a shaft, and the shaft needs to be sized to properly support the impeller. Looking at number seven, the mechanical seal. So the location of where the shaft passes through the casing is also referred to or is referred to as the stuffing box. You need to have some sort of sealing arrangement, in this case a mechanical seal, used to seal the gap between the shaft and the wall of the stuffing box. This is where the seal comes in to play. And it also prevents any leakage from coming down on or around the shaft. So again, wet end, hydraulic performance, mechanical end, means by which the wet end creates slow and pressure. Moving on to the next slide, this now reverts back to in the very beginning where I basically said we'd be talking about some designs later on in the presentation. What we have here is a horizontal end suction uh, picture or drawing. So looking at this very simply, you have a pump mounted next to a driver in this case, an electric motor, on a base plate, coupled together via a flexible coupling. So a direct drive connection of motor shaft to pump shaft via a flexible coupling. And that flexible coupling is contained within the coupling uh, box. This is also referred to as a long coupled arrangement as opposed to close coupled. With close coupled, imagine the bearing frame, the part between the coupling box and the casing, no bearing frame assembly being there, and the impeller directly mounting on to the end of the motor shaft. So we have a horizontal end suction arrangement, long coupled in this case, close coupled, no bearing frame, impeller mounting directly on the end of the motor shaft, and a term that's often used and synonymous with horizontal end suction that is good to know as well is called a back pull-out assembly. This allows the complete bearing frame assembly, again, the guts between the coupling box and the casing, including the impeller and cover, to be completely removed without having to remove the casing and disturbing the suction and discharge piping. So a very good term 
uh, to keep track of. Moving on to mag drive. Here with the mag drive, a very good definition, a chemical process pump with no shaft seal. Here it's very interesting with how this pump operates in that we're talking about magnetic fields. You can see that there's various labels uh, and arrows in this picture, and essentially you have a magnetic attraction between an outer set of magnets through a containment shell or containment can to an inner set of magnets. The outer magnet is not in the process liquid. The inner magnet, the impeller, the shaft are in the liquid contained in the hermetically sealed containment can or shell. Mag drives are very important when dealing with corrosive liquids, toxic liquids, liquids that may have emission concerns, difficult to seal liquids. And one interesting thing that you may or may not know, by their very nature, when we looked at the, at the horizontal end suction pump in the previous slide that had a mechanical seal, all mechanical seals by their very nature leak. All of them do, even if it's just vapor. There was a study that was done that said anywhere from maybe 0.13 to 0.35 gallons per minute. You may look at that and say, well, that doesn't seem like too much. Start multiplying that by hundreds and thousands of pumps within chemical plants, it adds up. Taking mag drive a step further in this slide, this was really cool and meant to show that you have a drive magnet, which is the outer magnet, a driven magnet, which is the inner magnet. You can see how they come together, blue on green, magnetic attraction as they attract one another, causes the impeller to spin. I thought this was a really cool slide uh, demonstrating how that works. We're almost there. So the last two designs, self-priming and vertical. On self-priming, you're basically describing a centrifugal pump that uses an air and liquid mixture to reach a fully primed or flooded liquid condition. Self-priming pumps take suction from a source of liquid below the center line of the pump. This is often referred to as a suction lift. In order to achieve priming, the liquid from an external source has to be initially introduced into the empty pump through some sort of fill plug or fill port. And you essentially need to have enough liquid in the casing or the tank so that you're filled up to the suction. That's what the left picture here shows. You can see it's pulling liquid up from a source below the center line, combination of air and water or liquid, and the liquid initially upon priming is halfway up to the suction. So during priming, the air enters the pump mixed with water at the impeller. The water and air are discharged together by the rotating action of the impeller into what's called the tank or the reservoir. Air is lighter, naturally lighter, and is going to tend to rise. Water is heavier, is going to tend to sink. And basically, this air-liquid mixture continues until all the air has been evacuated and the pump is fully primed or fully flooded. On the vertical pump, as you can see there to the right, you're basically talking about a pump that's in some sort of tank, dump, pit, basin, um, whatever the case may be. The impeller and part of the casing need to be placed beneath the fluid or liquid level to be pumped. And the main power uh, mechanism of this pump, the motor, the coupling, everything is located above the mounting plate outside of the liquid. So you have a vertical shaft supported in a center column. The impeller pumps to or through the casing and out through the discharge pipe. So at this point in time, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Eric, who also loves pumps, and he'll be getting into uh, specifics on how to read a pump curve. All yours, Eric. Very much. Thank you, Jerry. Um, yeah, so my piece is going to focus a little bit more on pump selection, um, how to read a pump curve, and a lot of the stuff that Jerry just covered is very much related. Um, 
specifically with regards to uh, you know the pump type that we're going to choose uh, before actually <clears throat> deciding what type of um, performance we need. We need to figure out what type of pump is going to go into the application. So um, just in general, uh, some of the options you know back before we had everything electronically uh, available. Um, the pump curves were, you know, manually selected. Uh, there were books of, of curves that showed all of the different selections, all the different pump types at, at different speeds. Um, on the right here, we can see that, you know, we're, we're showing a manual pump curve on top. Uh, the electronic software, there's a number of different packages out there. PumpFlow and IntelliQuip are among the most popular now. Um, we've been using PumpFlow for a number of years. We're starting to get into uh, IntelliQuip, and we are hoping to make that transition pretty soon, but we are still using PumpFlow and working on the uh, IntelliQuip selector and configurator um, currently. So uh, regardless of which method you're using, whether you're looking at the old pump curves or using the software, the really the, the two main things that you absolutely need are, are the flow in the head. You need to know, you know what, what is the flow required and what is the head. The other factors that certainly come into play are the uh, fluid density or the specific gravity of the fluid and the electrical frequency. And the electrical frequency is really just dependent upon where you're located geographically. If you're in the States, everyone operates at 60 Hertz. Um, a lot of places in Europe is 50, and it just changes depending on where you are. So let's look at a pump curve. So this is a typical pump curve. And what exactly is a pump curve? So a pump curve is a graphical representation of the performance characteristics. So you can see that we have on the x-axis is our flow, and we can see that with this typical pump curve, we listed <clears throat> multiple units to avoid having to uh, create duplicate curves for you know, imperial and, and uh, SI units. So we have on the bottom uh, gallons per minute and also cubic meters per hour. Just like the speedometer on your car, you got miles per hour and kilometers per hour. And on the, on the y-axis, there's a few different plots that are here. Um, we're going to focus right now on just the, the flow and head. You can see on the y-axis it says total differential head in meters, or it's also in, in feet. So feet is the imperial unit and meters is obviously a metric. Um, the curve also shows the horsepower at the bottom of the screen and NPSH. So this is quite a busy chart. Um, I'm going to try to break it down and uh, kind of dissect it a little bit in the following slides. But the main takeaway is um, flow in the head. You need to start with the flow in the head. Before we get into this plot in detail, um, I just want to show everybody where, where you could start. How do you, how do you get a general idea of you know, what type of pump you need to select? Um, so back, again, before everything was on the computer, uh, we used to publish bulletins for each one of our pump series. So this is an example out of our horizontal and suction pumps, our, our 1500 series, what we call it in fiber. And Jerry touched on that in uh, one of the slides. That was one of the pump types that he discussed, the end suction. Um, we, have, we had these basic charts uh, at 60 hertz and at 50 hertz. So I'll get into the motors a little bit later, uh, hopefully. Um, at 60 hertz, there's several nominal speeds that are available. So you have 3,500, 3, 1,750. There are other speeds, but just to make this chart a little bit more legible, we just stuck with these two. Um, what this is is basically our complete product offering in a single plot. So just like the pump curve before, um, you know, we're showing the flow on the x-axis and the total head in feet and meters on the y-axis. And what we're trying to show here is that we're using 
the example of 500 gallons per minute at 100 feet. So this is our design point. Uh, it's called a number of different things, operating point, design point. Um, but we're, we're shooting for 500 gallons per minute at 100 feet. So from this basic chart, we can see that um, if, we're, if we're using 60 hertz electrical service, we have several different options just uh, off the bat here. Um, looking at the top chart at 1750, um, if we draw the yellow line up from 500 and right from the 100, uh, which is our, our head, we can see that it intersects at a particular pump size. It happens to be the, the three by four by 13. I know it's difficult to read, but the numbers in white that are on top of the, the plot are actually showing uh, the pump size. So in this case, it looks like we're very close to the, the three by four by 13 at 1750 RPM. Um, it looks like maybe four by four by 10 is very close to that. And for 3500 RPM, uh, we're talking about a three by four by eight. And again, it's difficult to read, but that's what those numbers in white say that are on top of the curves. So we're gonna focus on 500 gallons per minute at 100 feet. And I just wanna show you one more slide. We have the same exact uh, curves, our, our product offerings at 50 Hertz. So at 50 Hertz, you have a completely different selection because operating at a different speed, um, you basically need a different pump size and or impeller trim to, to get to the same point. So the, the frequency is very relevant uh, as far as what type of pump you're, you're selecting. Uh, so next slide, this is the same curve that we showed before. Um, I just pointed out all the key terminology and, and points that I wanna review on this very busy curve. So this, this particular curve is, is the three by four by 13. From the previous chart, uh, you know, we happen to see that that 500 gallons per minute at 100 feet it intersected at this three by four by 13 pump. So now I'm looking at the details, uh, the specific curve for this particular pump, the three by four by 13 at this speed at 1750 RPM. And this is the family of curves. It's called a family of curves because it shows all of the different impeller trims that are available for this pump size. So at this speed for this pump size, you can see on the right, I circled all the impeller trims. Um, this pump is available anywhere from a nine inch to a 13 inch impeller diameter. So what we're showing here is not just one curve, but we're showing six different or I'm sorry, five different impeller trims. Okay, so each one of these curves represents an impeller trim. Um, so we'll just go through again. I, I mentioned before that the flow is on the x-axis. We have that in multiple units. Um, best efficiency point. So that's an important term. Please remember it. Uh, BEP stands for best efficiency point. And you can see that on this particular curve, the best efficiency point looks to be very close to our design point. So the triangle for the design point, 500 gallons per minute, if you were to drop a line straight down from that triangle, just like those yellow lines did, you would end up at 500 gallons per minute. And if you took it out to the left, you would end up at 100 feet. So that is our design point. Um, you know, we can see by where the design point falls on the curve, that you know it requires approximately an impel 11 inch impeller diameter to to get to that point so like if you could see that if we were using a 12 or a 13 inch impeller diameter we'd be significantly over that design point in terms of head so 500 gallons per minute at 100 feet we're looking at an 11 inch impeller diameter um, it looks like a good selection because the design point is very close to the best efficiency point. Uh, some other very useful terms from, from this chart, shut off head refers to the head um, at zero flow. So if you have a discharge valve on your pump and you close that valve completely, you're not gonna be moving any water, but the pump is basically gonna be putting out the, the full pressure that it can. So that's referred to as shut off head. 
and the other side of the curve is run out. Run out refers to the point, the furthest point out um, on the curve, uh, maximum flow. You basically do not want to be running there. Um, the other circled percentages on this chart are, are that is your efficiency. So as you move across the pump curve from zero flow to your maximum flow, you can see that we're crossing through different efficiencies. At, at very low flow, the efficiency is very low, and then same thing at run out, you have lower efficiency. So this appears to be a good selection because of all these reasons. And then I put the blue lines in here just to represent that there is a preferred operating region. Um, past that, past those points, past those lines, if you're to the left of the left line, you really don't want to be operating there too close to shot off head. You really don't want to be operating too close to run out. You want to be somewhere in between there so that your pump is happy. Um, move on to the next slide here. Full question, Mary. Okay. Thanks. Uh, next poll question. Again, you'll be able to select on the next slide. What are you currently using to select pumps for your applications? Are you using a manual curve, uh, some type of software like pump flow, something else? Let's take a look and see what all of you are using. I'll give you a couple seconds here. We're going to go quick on this one since we're uh, getting close to the end of the presentation. So let's see what everyone's using. So I have a lot of people that are using the uh, manual curves, uh, not totally nice. surprising. And then we have um, quite a few that are using some type of different software. So yeah, I think there's definitely a, a good range in there. Okay. <clears throat> so the electronic selection. So this this is an example out of Pump Flow. This is the selection software that you know we've been using the longest and still using it. Um, one of the very first things that you need to do in Pumpflow after you log in is select your electrical frequency. Uh, we mentioned this before. It basically gives you a whole another set of, of data to look at, if, whether it's 50 hertz or 60 hertz. The selection is completely different. So that's one of the most important things. The second thing is the pump type. Depending on the pump type, you may or may not have different performance curves. A lot of our pumps actually share the performance curves, but it's it's important to select the, the pump type. So we're selecting the electrical frequency and the pump type in this screen. And in this case, again, we're going to select the, the horizontal anti-process pump, which is the same uh, type of curve and pump that we selected on the uh, manual selection side. The next screen in pump flow is, is this, where again, the, the two most important things that you need to know, your flow and your head. If we, we use the same exact example as, as above, the 500 US GPM. You can change the units. Uh, if you're using the metric, metric units, uh, you, know, you have a lot of different choices for units, but in this case, we're gonna stick with the same example, 500 gallons per minute at 100 feet. Um, one of the other things that we mentioned above was the, the you know, the fluid density, um, i.e. The, the specific gravity, which are very much related. But you need to select your fluid because that will determine, um, it has a lot to do with the horsepower and other aspects of the curve. So we're going to stick with water in this case. And then, of course, the pump type. So we have a couple different options as to, uh, you know, what type of pump you want to choose. And for speeds, I didn't select any particular speed in this case. I just let the software choose whatever it needed to, whatever speed it wanted to, but I wanted to stick with the 1500 end sections. So again, user must specify desired flow head in the fluid being pumped and the pump type. So next next screen, you just click search. Either top or top or bottom uh, left hand side is a search button. Once you hit that button, it gives you a bunch of different curves. And the reason for that is just like we showed before on the uh, you know the manual selection where you showed the complete product offering. There are a few different pumps that 
can possibly meet this criteria, this 500 gallons per minute at 100 feet. It's not just one, one selection. So the software is picking any possible pump that falls within your search criteria. Uh, we're going to dig into these a little bit more on the next slide. But again, this is a list of all the available pump options that were within the parameters previously selected. Um, this slide just kind of blows up uh, the charts a little bit more, and you can see you can see by these curves that you know where where the red triangle is. You want you want to try to get that red triangle as close as possible to your best efficiency point, where you can see those green ISO lines. Um, where they're the tightest, the, the bullseye really marks the uh, best efficiency point. So you can see that the second selection there, that 3 by 4 by 13, which we manually selected before, uh, the software is basically telling you that you have, you know, an efficiency. It, it gives you some basic numbers here in terms of the efficiency, the, the, the motor horsepower, the frame size. So you get all the basic information here, and then you're allowed to pick one of these pumps depending on which one you feel is the best one. In my opinion, the 3 by 4 by 13 it's the closest to the best efficiency point. It has the lowest uh, horsepower requirement. Um, that, to me, looks like the best selection. So uh, we're going to go with that. And then once you click on that particular pump curve, you get a full breakdown of you know, this is a data sheet from that particular pump selection. So this is a 3 by 4 by 13 pump uh, showing the impeller trim. So this may be difficult to read. Uh, the text is kind of small. But the data sheet really gives you all the specifics that you need for this particular pump. It, it puts in the search criteria for you, 500 gallons per minute at 100 feet. It shows you the pump curve in bold. So it still shows the min and the max diameter. But the bold line with the with the arrow pointing, uh, I'm sorry, with the triangle pointing to it, that's exactly, that's your design point right there. So it points it out on the curve. Um, it, it shows you where you fall on the curve, and it gives you all the supporting, supporting data. It, it tells you the MPSH, uh, your power required at the point, your power required. So at the end of the curve, NOL power will try to get into that as much as possible uh, following up. But as you can see, there's just a lot more information from the electronic software. But in actuality, all the same information is on the manual pump curve. It just presents it in a much nicer and easier to read way um, as opposed to studying the pump curve. But either curve, the electronic or the manual, gives you the same information. And we're going to look at Okay, pump formulas, uh, these are the affinity laws, very useful formulas. Um, I'm not going to get into this too much right now, but it's a way to associate um, flow, head, and power at a given either RPM or, or impeller diameter. So you, you can calculate what your flow head or power would be if you were to change either the speed of the impeller or the, the diameter of the impeller. And these formulas are incredibly useful for a lot of different things. They're actually used quite um, extensively by the software that's uh, making the electronic selections as well to kind of dial in that performance. So what are the things you look for when making a pump selection? Um, you know, which selection offers the highest efficiency at the rated condition? You know, we went over that. The, the, the pump that we chose, you saw that triangle very close to the uh, best efficiency point. So, again, does the operating condition fall near the pump's best efficiency point? That's a very important consideration. And then which selection requires the smallest motor rating? Um, that's, those are the three main takeaways from that. Um, I can't get into this too too much, but NPSH is is another is another factor that you must verify before deciding on pump selection. So NPSH is on the on the pump curve on the manual. It's on the manual pump curve and it's on the electronic 
pump curve. It's, it's all over. And I'm going to just go through these definitions kind of quickly. And if I have time, I'll, I'll go back and um, put a little bit more detail into these. But uh, NPSH, just to define it, there's, there's NPSHR and then there's NPSHA. NPSHR is what we show on the pump curve. This is related to the pump. And the NPSHR, as you can see by the definition, the absolute pressure that must be present in a liquid for a pump to avoid cavitating while pumping the liquid. And then NPSHA is more of a system uh, calculation, and it's a measure of how close a liquid is to converting to, into a vapor and cavitating. So let's, what's, what's cavitation? We, we talked about that in both NPSHR and A. So cavitation is the formation of small vapor bubbles in a liquid, um, which then collapse almost as quickly as they form. So in a pump, cavitation occurs at the point of lowest pressure, um, which is typically at the inlet to the impeller vanes. Um, when, when these vapor bubbles produced by cavitation collapse, they, they generate a, a huge amount of pressure at a very small point. Um, you know the when these when these vapor bubbles burst, it's it's basically like a super high pressure at a very concentrated point, and it creates significant damage uh, inside the pump. Uh, typically, you see cavitation on that leading edge of the of the impeller vanes, and uh, it's something that is very damaged. It's an erosive type of uh, damage inside the uh, pump that affects the impeller and the casing. So NPSHR, I'm going to just flip to the next slide here. Hey, Show Eric. Yeah. We're unfortunately running a little bit long here. Apologies to everyone with uh, some of the technical difficulties that we had earlier. Would you mind moving to the uh, motor selection? Um, and that way we can kind of sure. close this out and get maybe one question in. Sure, no problem. So NPSH, Thanks, the Sarah. biggest thing that you need about NPSH is that the NPSH available in your system has to be higher than the NPSHR. That's that's the main thing. The NPSH is shown on the curve, and again, at 500 gallons per minute, we can see what our required NPSH is. So if, if, if that reverses, then you're going to have cavitation, which is bad. <laughs> um, motor selection. Um, again, this is a curve that is on the pump curve, on, the, on all the pump curves. We can see that with an 11-inch impeller diameter, I have it circled on the chart there, that it looks like with an 11-inch impeller diameter at that point, again, 500 gallons per minute, the pump is basically requiring approximately 20 horsepower to operate at that point. You can see that if you go out a little bit further um, to the right of that point where the flow is higher, you're going to require more power. Um, in this case, it looks like approximately 22 horsepower. So if you wanted to size this motor so that it wouldn't overload, non-overloading, NOL, that's what that means, um, you would need a 25 horsepower motor because motors are sized at particular intervals. There's nothing between a 20 and a 25 horsepower. So if if the customer is 100% confident that they will never go over that 500 gallons per minute, um, they may be okay with a 20, 20 horsepower motor, but if they're not sh certain where they're operating, it's always better to size the motor for NOL, which means that it doesn't matter where you run it on the curve, it's not going to overload. Um, some of these other considerations, uh, you could read them off the chart, but, uh, you know, will a pump be operated on a variable frequency drive? This affects the motor selection. If you do have a VFD, the motor is typically provided with uh, shaft grounding rings because of the way the VFD operates. And of course, the, the, the fluid specific gravity is very important for motor horsepower. Um, as you can see by this formula here, brake horsepower, specific gravity is on the top of this equation. So specific gravity of water is one. So anything higher than one, you're basically multiplying that for the brake horsepower. So if your specific gravity was two, your brake horsepower would be twice as much as what it was for water. So very important, um, all these considerations for, for sizing a motor are, are important. So although flow and head are the most important for you know, picking a, 
pump that would work, uh, knowing the specific gravity, um, understanding NPSH are all very important factors. And with that, um, I have some other slides here with once you decide on a pump, uh, you know, what, what type of drawings we can provide and, you know, what we have available after you've selected the performance. But um, I think we're, we'll move on to the, the, the questions, Mary. Yeah, we're, we're going to head to uh, do at least one question. Again, uh, thank you, uh, Jerry and Eric. Uh, apologies to anyone with any uh, technical difficulties. Unfortunately, it did make us go a little bit long here. But we're going to do at least one question. If we do not get to your question, don't worry. We do answer all of them um, after the event, so either via email or we'll give you a call. So. Let's hit at least one question here. And just a reminder to everyone, we will actually keep the platform open for another 30 minutes after the event so that you can complete the uh, quiz and print out anything else that you would like. So let's hit one question here. So is it better to be to the left or the right of BEP? I guess I'll take that. I guess it's kind of a trick question. You, you want to be, it's better to be to the left of BEP just because there's more room uh, for to play there. Uh, to the to the right of BEP, um, you're increasing your, your NPSHR and it's, it's, you know, you're increasing your horsepower. There's, there's more chance of a, uh, cavitation if you're further to the right of BEP you have a little bit more leeway to the left so it is better to be to the left okay thank you Eric and thank you everybody here today for attending hope you're staying safe and warm and aren't digging out uh, as I mentioned before the actual platform is going to be live for about another 30 minutes so you can finish up whatever you need we will reach back out to all of you after the um, presentation if you had questions and don't forget to go to secocertified.com uh, we have uh, two events uh, scheduled uh, already for uh, March and April and another pump event that will be happening in May so feel free to go over there and register uh, we thank you for coming and hope you have a wonderful day take care <laughs>